So welcome everybody to uh, our afternoon seminar at the OII. I'm Jonathan Zittrain. I'm one of the people who teaches here. And uh, before I introduce our guest, uh, Professor Brayman, I thought it might be useful to uh, go around the table and simply declare uh, who we are so we know who each other is. <laughs> so, Helen. Um, I'm Margaret. I'm a professor of uh, society and the internet here in the OII, and I specialize in uh, Hi, I'm Alice Adolf, visiting fellow here and a senior lecturer at Napier University, interested in the same sort of area as you, I think. We'll soon find out. Anyway. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Andreas Bush, I'm reader in European politics in the politics department of this university and fellow of Hartford College. I'm working on privacy yeah, yeah. and cooperating with Charles Raab on um, an ECPR workshop in two months. Hi, I'm Paolo Campana. I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Turin uh, in uh, Communication and uh, Sociology. I'm, uh, and I'm a research associate at the Center for Criminology at the University of Oxford. I'm Beth Crutch. I'm from the Computing Services part, special interest in um, information and management. I'm Tom McLean. I'm doing a PhD at LSE down in London. And I'm specifically interested in the role of secrecy in democratic politics. I'm Jenny Fry, I'm a research fellow here at the and I'm interested in the social aspects of e-research. And uh, <coughs> this is me, I'm Ralph Schroeder, I'm also a research fellow here, and I'm interested in e-science and e-research. Jennifer DeVere, I'm a DFL student with the OII, and uh, my interest is the policy environment for open access scholarly communication. I'm Jushi, I'm developing my proposal to the Institute of the University. I'm Tadi Rasmussen, I'm uh, uh, from the University of Oslo, I'm a visiting scholar here right now. I'm Matthew Kapitov, I'm a PhD student at the London School of Economics and Sociology, and I'm doing work on border security, information exchange, and privacy. Uh, my name is Mark, I'm studying for the BCL in law here at Oxford. I'm Tarek Shiniti, I'm a doctoral student in Oxford at the James Martin Institute for Science and Civilization and researching the governance of the internet. I'm Shpali Verka, I'm a DPhil student here at the OI and at the Department of Politics and I'm looking at the impact of the internet and government. Uh, Bill Dutton, uh, a professor here and I'm very impressed with the range of and mix of people you've drawn. <laughs> 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 Actually quite a diverse group of institutions and disciplines. I'm David Shotton. I'm in the zoology department. <laughs> <laughs> that was planned. I have nothing for you. <laughs> I, I do uh, informatics work, but I was particularly stimulated by three recent documentaries on BBC Two called The Trap, dealing with society and the way it's going. And, and I think this subject is very relevant to that. Um, Carla Garbarino from Oxford Analytica. I'm just interested. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Professor Brayman visits us from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, she has been studying the macro effects of new information technologies since the mid 1980s. 80s. Is that right? And uh, if there's any kind of line that connects uh, the many dots of her career, it is looking at the macro level of things. And uh, in 1997, 98. Uh, she created Africa's first program in telecommunications and information policy at the University of South Africa. Um, the book that I guess just had a little bit of documentation go around is one of her latest ventures, Change of State. Uh, it's a fascinating book which, uh, again, takes the macro kind of view and it talks about the ways in which uh, some of the individual threads of law and information policy and telecoms policy. Uh, there's actually a whole greater than the sum of the parts, basically claims this book. And understanding the new bureaucratic state really requires thinking about what a new information state looks like. And I suspect we'll hear a little bit about that today. She's also written a fascinating article for First Monday on post-humanism and what it means uh, when many of the flows, information flows, including legal information flows, are mediated by or created by machines. And uh, the answers turn out to be worrisome. 
So here to put perhaps some fear into us and to <laughs> limit us, uh, allow me to introduce Professor Brayman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here and, and uh, very exciting to see what the OII has already accomplished in the first few years of its life. Um, I hope that what I have to offer will at least provide some conceptual and theoretical frames for the range of interests in the room. I have, uh, I, won't, I was thinking as I listened uh, to your interests as I went around, I've done other work that deals with e-research, um, some of which I can point you towards afterwards. That's probably the one set of interests that I won't address directly here today. And I'll be the uh, freedom of expression professor at the University of Bergen in 2008, so I'll be closer to you then. Uh, so yes, I'll be uh, trying to provide some highlights from the um, from change of state information policy and power today. And uh, let me first just introduce broadly what the argument is that I'm trying to make. It's that there's a form of power which I call informational power that now dominates over and has changed the nature of power in its instrumental, structural, and symbolic forms. These are very familiar concepts for those of you who study political science, and I'll be coming back in a little while to explain more of what I mean by those. And I'm also arguing that uh, the form of the state we know as the bureaucratic welfare state has, uh, in fact, changed into a new form, which I call the informational state. I was one of those people in the late 70s and early 80s who was wandering around saying, oh, the state is in decline because of the growth of corporate power. Well, of course, the state did not go away by any means. What it did was it changed, uh, it, it changed its form. Um, I argue that information policy is a means of exercising informational power. And the, and the point here is that our laws and regulations that deal with information creation, processing, flows, and use, in fact, serve the goals of the laws and regulations, but they do a second thing as well, and that is that they serve as tools of power for the state. And it's that that has changed the nature of the state. And I'm also arguing that if we want to really see what the effects of any given law or regulation is, the effects of our policy are, we need to look at what's actually going on in society. And uh, in this book, as a way of um, uh, organizing how we think about changes in the nature of society, I've done it by looking at identity, meaning individual identity, the identity of the state, and how those two are negotiated in areas like citizenship. Uh, structure, meaning the structures of three types of systems, social systems, technological systems, informational systems, the borders of the social, technological, and informational systems, and the way in which we treat change in each of those kinds of systems. Are laws and regulations stimulating change, impeding it, or biasing the nature in which it will uh, take place? A few basic concepts. Um, I think I treat the state as an organizational and cultural form that is a complex adaptive system. Uh, for those of you who have not spent a lot of time with complex adaptive systems theory, it's a body of theory that is, uh, has relations known as chaos theory or punctuated equilibrium theory, second order cybernetics, et cetera, et cetera, depending on which is your disciplinary uh, home. Uh, from my perspective, complex adaptive systems theory is the most useful version. Um, if what we're thinking about is social processes. And when we're thinking about complex adaptive systems, uh, one of the things that is of great interest, both theoretically and empirically, is looking at what happens to systems when um, they uh, lose their periods of stability, perhaps because of changes in the empirical environment, perhaps because of endogenous changes. And often they become, there are changes to the system where they become turbulent, sometimes even chaotic. And uh, when they become chaotic, then you may come out of a period of chaos into a new type of stable system or perhaps oscillations between types of systems. That, that moment in which a, a, state, a, con, a system is in one condition and changes to another condition is known as a phase change or a change of state. And so the, the book title is a pun. I'm talking about a phase change in a complex adaptive system. That system that we're talking about is, in fact, the political form we know as a state. I define information policy as all laws and regulations that deal to information creation, processing, flows, and use. It, I use it as an umbrella term. And I'll defend this definition by saying this is an area in which there is no consensual terminology. So uh, this is the definition I'm taking for the purposes of this book. And just to highlight um, uh, what that means when we look at the law, uh, this means that in the US case, there are then 20 information policy principles in the US Constitution. For, it, for those of you who know uh, anything about U.S. law, this is a dramatically different view from the common view, which says we have the First Amendment, and uh, which deals with freedom of speech, and we have an amendment that deals with privacy, and that's it. But uh, from my perspective, using this definition, there are many more constitutional-level principles that apply. 
Um, two caveats here, let me say that I'm talking, I will be using US law as a case. Uh, you have to use one system as a case. But uh, the trends that I'm pointing to are also found in governments around the world and at the international level, and I'll spend a little time towards the close talking about relationships uh, what, between what's happening in different countries. Uh, the second is that I will be, I'm keenly conscious of the uh, OII focus here, although the depth, the range of interest in the room is broad. What I'm talking about will relate to the internet in three ways. First, I hope it provides a theoretical and conceptual framework for thinking about uh, relationships between the internet and our political lives and for thinking about how we make and the consequences of making internet policy. Secondly, the technological changes that led to the internet and that are and our technological environment created by the internet are very much uh, a, a cause and effect of the kinds of changes in the law that I'm talking about. Um, and third, I think there's some implications specifically for internet policy analysis that I will also come back to at the close. Uh, I use this concept of the state because I've, I, I think it's useful as a way of breaking out of any particular either a normative, ideological, or structural way of thinking about the state. So if you're inside of the normative view of the bureaucratic welfare state, this uh, complex adaptive systems theory still ap applies. Secondly, I think it provides a very good framework for thinking about changes in relations between the state, society, and the law. And, and each one of those pairs, I think we're seeing changes in the relationships. And it helps us place government uh, in relation to governance and governmentality. And by government, I mean the formal laws and regulations, the programs, the agencies, the practices of geopolitically recognized states. And that's normally what we think about when we think about law and policy. But in a period as riven with change as the one in which we're currently living, Governance and governmentality are also important from a policy perspective. And by governance, I mean the formal and informal practices, rules, institutions, uh, approaches of both public and private se sector entities. So um, uh, structural effects of decisions by corporations are also important from a policy perspective. And by governmentality, I mean the cultural habits and practices that both sustain and enable governance and government. The broad view of policy needs to, in my view, include all three of those. Thinking about uh, treating the state in this way helps us deal with those. Today, my focus is on government, um, although we will see imp uh, implications for the other two and influences by the other two. I define information policy in this way as, a, uh, as an umbrella term for all law and regulation that deals with information, communication, and cultural policy. Uh, I think it's useful because we knew already by the early 80s, as Ithiel de Solapool probably said it most clearly in that period, uh, that the then existing legal and economic categories were inadequate for thinking about uh, laws and regulations in a period in which society had qualitatively changed as a result of uh, the amount of technological change that we had. And, um, in this crowd, I won't defend that position. Uh, in other crowds, that takes more defense. Um, I also want to make the point here that I'm dealing simultaneously with two time scales. One is, uh, in effect, the geological time scale of changes in the state as a political form, as that has taken place over a long stretch, 500 years or so. And the, the, the transformation from the bureaucratic to the information state um, takes place on that time horizon. But we also know that there has been an, ex an extreme acceleration of changes in certain areas since 9-11. Um, uh, in some cases, complete inversions of what had been uh, the legal situation before then. And so I will be uh, using some of those examples, because they're particularly vivid, to highlight the longer term trends as well. Um, although in my view, there's nothing that's happened since 9-11 that, that didn't have its roots uh, either short or long while before. And lastly, I define information policy in this way because it's a very useful heuristic for, for crossing the traditional legal silos. There's um, a longstanding habit in the law, and frankly, I, <laughs> for anybody who gives talks, I assume that's all of you, there's no more, um, uh, I couldn't imagine somebody in the room who would make me more cautious about what I say about the law than Jonathan. So um, <laughs> I'm uh, trying to be extremely careful here. I can leave if you'd like to be more interesting. <laughs> No, just uh, save your critique for afterwards. 
Um, you know, but most legal analysis, you look at privacy law, you're looking at privacy law, you're looking at libel law, you're looking at libel law, and my argument is that we don't live in a world in which you're walking down the block and the sign says you are now in the zone of privacy law, and that on the next block there's a sign that says you are now in the zone of defamation law. Uh, we experience the world in which all of these things interact with each other. They're, uh, uh, they're a whole for us, and so it seems to me that if we really want to know the effects of what we're doing in the law, uh, we need to look across um, legal silos to see commonalities in what's happening with how we treat information and information uh, technologies. So I'm making three uh, claims about what we should be doing when we do policy analysis, and I should say, actually, my punchline, if you were to ask me what it is when we're doing policy analysis, I would say our, our goal is to answer the question, what are we doing to ourselves? That's really what we want to know at the end of the day. Everything else is a piece of that larger question. What are we doing to ourselves? So to do that, I think it's really it's about society, not about the language of the law. And often, um, uh, telecommunications regulation, other bodies of regulation spend a lot of time working with uh, the language of the law. And yes, we need to work with the language of the law uh, when we are incrementally changing um, what's going on. But at the end of the day, it's not about the language. Again, it's about what we're doing to ourselves. So I think we need to triangulate traditional types of legal analysis with contemporary social theory and um, uh, not, not all legal analysis, but still an unfortunate amount of it when we're dealing with things like freedom of speech, uh, rests upon either 18th century social theory, philosophy, or imaginations of what 18th century philosophy was about. And we have a lot of additional social theory, very contemporary social theory, uh, that is also useful for thinking about the legal environment and the results of empirical social science research. And here, our conversation goes back a few years. But um, uh, there's this is one of the things that I like so much about the OII is that in this institution, um, you're bringing together what we know about the empirical environment that the law is addressing, as well as what's going on in the law. And that combination has been um, uh, not as sustained and rich over the course of thinking about information law and policy as one would like it to have been. And then I'm introducing the concept of policy precession to talk about how the effects of different laws and regulations intersect with each other. And again, uh, nothing operates in a vacuum. The word precession, of course, comes from physics. It talks about how systems that have interlocking, uh, interacting axes rotate around each other so that the effects in any single system depend upon uh, what happens in the rotation of the other system. And certainly the same thing happens with information law and policy. One vivid example of information precession is uh, what happened with the Stasi files after the close, after, um, after the Berlin Wall fell. And of course, there was initially uh, a, a moment in which everybody said, great, let's open the Stasi files and find out what was going on in the former GDR. And people did that for a while. Um, and that was in response to one set of legal changes. And then came along personal data law. And they shut the files down because they said in any given person's file, there will be information about other persons that we shouldn't be releasing because of our protection of personal data. And so they shut again. Now, there's a lot that's a very complicated political story around that. But I think it's a vivid example of how different laws and regulations intersect in terms of yielding what we actually experience. So what I want to do today is talk a bit more about what I mean by informational power, give a few exemplars of informational, uh, information policy issues in each of those areas where we're seeing social change, identify a few of the key findings regarding our social and political conditions as a result of the change of state, talk briefly about the global and comparative implications, and then specifically what that means for how you conduct internet policy. Again, the concepts of instrumental, structural, and symbolic power are deeply embedded in the political science literature. Just to review, by instrumental power, I say I'm controlling your behavior by hitting you over the head. So guns and tanks are what we think of as instrumental power. Structural power, I'm controlling your behavior by controlling the institutions through which you operate and the rules that govern your behavior. Um, you're working on degrees. You're following certain rules in order to achieve that. That's structural power. Symbolic power is also known as consensual power, or in Joseph Nye's formulation, soft power. It's controlling behavior by shaping the ideas, the beliefs, the ways in which you perceive the world. I'm arguing that there's a fourth form of power, which I'm calling informational, which has to do with 
both control over the informational bases of power in its instrumental, structural, and symbolic forms, and offers to us new techniques of power that were not previously available. An example of how informational power changes the way in which other forms of power operate. If we think of instrumental power, you've got a gun, it's a classic. Uh, we now have smart guns, the bullets of which can actually go around corners and around walls to seek out their targets. If you use a smart gun, it's going to beat a dumb gun anytime. And that's a use of informational power changing the way in which we exercise instrumental power. An example of a new technique of power that informational techniques make available to us. Uh, we have uh, probably the easiest example is our ability to uh, mine massive databases comprised of different kinds of data for uh, patterns using any number of, of uh, ways of doing that. That's a different thing from having a few pieces of information about somebody on a card in a file cabinet. Political scientists also are long accustomed to talking about the difference between power in its actual form and in its potential form. In its actual form, uh, I'm hitting you over the head right now. In its potential form, it is uh, power that I'm claiming, but I'm not using it. I have, I'm not hitting you right now, but there's a big stick behind my back, and if you really annoy me, believe me, I will hit you. Um, and you don't see the stick, but I'm convincing you it's there. I think one of the key arenas for struggle today is actually around power in its virtual form. And here I'm using the word virtual as it's used by the Italian economist Roberto Scazzieri. Uh, Scazzieri was talking about production processes, and he describes virtual processes as those which don't currently exist. But we could bring them into existence using the resources we currently have and using the knowledge that we currently have. An example of that in the policy environment, information policy environment, would be governmental struggles over controlling encryption. Um, when a government says, thou shalt not work on encryption unless you're doing it for the government, they're saying, we know that there are going to be ways of encrypting information and decrypting information that don't now exist, but that could be brought into existence using the resources we now have and the knowledge we now have, if you put ex, you know, mathematicians, uh, at work on why problem for a while we're going to come up with those things. They don't exist now, they will serve power, uh, but they could exist. It's a virtual form of power. And I think we're seeing um, in battles over patents, uh, in a lot of what's going on in um, uh, those kinds of terrains, we're seeing uh, battles between governments and governments and their peoples over power in its virtual phases. Obviously, informational power is not new uh, in the way that information has always been important to society, but we can say there's an information society today. Uh, Engels' law still applies. Um, uh, the third point I've made, but what's particularly concerning to me about it is I think that um, the formal descriptions of government and the way you get them in civics classes or the way we see them discussed in the media and most of the ways that we traditionally analyze the exercise of political power actually obscures a lot of what is going on politically uh, because exercises of informational power are rarely in view. So a lot of what's going on, I think, is like what happens when you look at where the magician wants you to look. You know, he, the hand is over here and the real game is over there. And that's why I think it's particularly important to begin to understand what's going on with informational power and, and the way in which information policy uh, plays a role. Uh, so the first half of the book further builds the theoretical and conceptual framework I just uh, introduced um, and uh, the remainder of the book looks at a number of specific areas of the law and in those four categories, identity, structure, borders, and change. And uh, obviously no human being uh, could possibly look at the entire body of the law in this way, so I selected a number of issues. Um, and I won't read them out to you, but these are all of the issues that I looked at. And what I do in the book is, um, for each issue, I give a sort of short history of where does libel law come from uh, and what, what has it been all about. I give the current state of the law as it stands in the U.S. Uh, an unfortunate amount of, I think, analysis of laws and regulations that apply to the Internet, not that are coming out of the legal world, but that are coming out of other disciplines um, starts with some ignorance about what the actual state of the law is before you start dealing with the internet and so I was trying to respond to that uh, problem. Uh, and then it identifies somewhere between four and eight social trends that are either triggered by uh, these, the, the way the law has gone 
or have shaped it, and often these are interactive. And again, this is an old idea in legal analysis that society and the law mutually construct each other. Um, but it's in those social trends that the crux of the analysis uh, comes up. So these are the issues I looked at uh, in the area of identity, and my goal when I chose specific legal problems to look at was both to include those that are kind of obvious and familiar, like privacy, and those that may be less familiar to those who are working in the area of uh, internet policy. So thinking about the census, thinking about archival memory, um, there are communities that think about these things. They don't often intersect with thinking about the internet. In my view, uh, they should. These are the issues I looked at in the area of structure. These are the issues I looked at in the area of borders. And obviously, some of these, you could argue that they'd be placed in other places. But, um, uh, but I think there's a defense for at least organizing the book in this way. And these are the areas that I looked at when it came to change or preventing change in various systems. So again, I can't possibly talk through all of those today. What I've done is I've chosen three examples. And uh, the examples were chosen by, uh, because they demonstrate different ways in which we're experiencing changes in the law and what we can refer to as a transition period. In so many areas of the law, we don't, um, if you've got the tension between incrementally changing the law and radically changing the law, um, I'm among those who says, uh, who looks back at history and says, every time we've said social conditions are so different that we should throw the entire body of the law out, uh, you generally wind up with something totalitarian. Of course, you can achieve that in other ways as well. Uh, but um, uh, incremental approaches are a lot saner for a whole lot of reasons. So these examples have different relationships uh, with the process of changing the law in response to social change. The first, libel law, is an example of where there has been slow evolution of a very old, a very traditional body of law. Some of the changes we're seeing recently um, uh, both reflect and trigger social change in ways that may be, um, uh, that are particularly interesting, I think, when associated with other uh, important cultural trends. The second is an area, border law, uh, an area in which I think there's surprising and sometimes radical developments in the law in an area that, frankly, I think if you asked, I know we have w one border expert here, but if you ask the man in the street, I think most people would say they know where the border is, they know what goes on there. Yes, it's getting more information intense, but uh, there are more developments in that. And of the various legal areas that I looked at, actually the border provided the most surprises to me, I think. Um, and then the third example is one in which I think the significant trends that particularly well exemplifies uh, what becomes visible if you uh, look comprehensively at related trends in a lot of different areas of the law rather than only in one area of the law. And that example is what the state actually knows about itself. So in the area of libel law, uh, these were the trends I thought were particularly interesting. I'll, um, unless, there's, unless there's particular interest in it, because I've added some material on the internet, let me just go by this briefly and say there's a long history uh, before the U.S. in which libel law was very political. Anything that was critique of government or a person in government was seditious libel and quite dangerous. The U.S. innovation was truth is a defense. How can you have political conversation if you're not able to make an error and um, say strong things in the course of political conversation? Beginning a couple decades ago, that became um, repoliticized in the U.S., uh, beginning with Nixon and systematic use of libel law to actually uh, dismantle the investigative reporting organizations by requiring them to come into the courtroom over and over again and win lawsuits, but uh, dismantle the organizations because it was economically so successful. That's the, sh the short version of the longer story. Uh, a weakening of facticity, I think, is very interesting from the governmentality perspective. And in other work, uh, I'm, I'm trying to bring together everything we know about changes in the way that facts are being treated within the legal system. One of our kind of one of our assumptions about the law, uh, that's so obvious we think it doesn't need to be stated, is that we're dealing with facts. That's what all those rules of evidence are about, um, and it's at the center of how the legal legal systems operate. Uh, but we're seeing actually a number of ways in which it's getting undermined. In libel law, this began in um, a couple of decades ago when somebody was able to win. Um, a libel law, for those of you who haven't studied this area, it's, 
uh, the, it is damaging somebody's reputation with a false statement of something that you have asserted is a fact. So it's critical to the analysis of defamation that you've claimed that what you put forward is a fact. Uh, but a couple decades ago in the U.S., somebody was able to win a libel suit for a character in a novel. A novel is fiction. You start out by saying this is not fact. Uh, so if you can win a defamation case on something that doesn't even pretend to be fact, something's happened in how we treat the fact. Now this is kind of a minor strand in libel law. It's not uh, particularly important. It hasn't been used a lot. But when you link it to other things, um, one of the interesting developments in the U.S. a couple years ago was that the FBI was officially released from the requirement that it be acting on fact when it identifies someone as a target of surveillance. It's, that's not even defense of you made an error, but you were honestly trying to be, work on fact. It was a release from the requirement of facticity when they identify somebody for surveillance. And there are other trends. So I think here's an, here's an area in which you have um, something that may seem minor and probably would be minor on its own, but when you link it to other developments in the law in terms of a weakening of uh, a stress on facticity, it becomes important. Examination of state of mind. This goes back to the 1970s in libel law. Uh, up until then, evaluations of libel were based on the actual speech, the, the, the text or the statement that you made uh, in public to determine whether or not something had gone on. And in the 70s, they started looking at state of mind. Now, in the case of libel law, that meant things like, uh, if you were a reporter, did you have a question mark by some interview that you took in your book? Did you walk through the newsroom saying, I never did like that guy? Uh, something like that. Um, and it had consequences in the newsroom. So for a period, you had, rep uh, report you had lawyers saying to reporters, don't take notes, lock your notes up. Uh, hard to do investigative reporting if you haven't kept detailed notes. Um, so it had a real impact on the nature of reporting. Again, whatever goes on in libel law, that would just be libel law. But uh, a, one of the developments we've seen in the last few years in the U.S. is, um, again, a shift away from requiring actual behavior for determinations of guilt. Um, so again, it seems like an obvious thing that what the legal system does is it looks at what you actually do. And, and judgments would be based, based on what you actually did. There is, of course, a, a difficult speech action line. When is your speech so close to the action and so instrumental in causing an action that it should be treated as action? And we're well familiar with that. But at this point um, in the US, you can uh, be held accountable not just for intention, but for what is alleged intention. And when we look at some of the kinds of patterns that are being used to identify individuals as targets of surveillance, or perhaps even for arrest and, con and conviction, then um, uh, the fact that several decades ago we had examination of state of mind in libel law, when linked with other developments about replacing judgment of behavior with judgment of intention or judgment of alleged intention, this becomes an important uh, shift in the nature of the legal system. And then finally, a loss of the distinction between human and other types of identity. Jonathan referred to other work that I've done that talks about uh, post-human law in which we are uh, privileging, um, making legal decisions to serve the telecommunications network rather than to serve people, and uh, decisions for the social world being made by machines rather than by people. Uh, in the case of libel law, we have trade or product libel. You're familiar with this maybe from uh, a famous law case with Oprah Winfrey a couple years ago when she stood up in public and said, don't eat meat, it's bad for you. The meat industry in the U.S. Uh, came after her and said, you can't say that. They won. So now we have defamation of meat uh, won. Um, and again, it's not such a big deal perhaps in libel law, but when you associate it with the developments I talk about in post-human law and others talk about in other areas, the fact that the legal system is uh, blurring the line, uh, those of you who think about cyborgs would be interested in this. Um, this becomes an important development. The, the network, uh, the geopolitical borders. Um, the first piece of this I realized a couple decades ago when those of you who are grad students or post-grad students know this kind of thing. You pick a project like, I'm going to read every single internal document at the Federal Communications Commission that deals with international communication. When I did that, uh, it I realized that actually for the U.S., for decades and decades, um, the boundaries of the telecommunications network were not the geopolitical boundaries, 
of the country. They were the technological boundaries of the system. So Canada and Mexico were treated as domestic for a lot of telecommunications regulatory purposes because you did not have to change your technology when you crossed the border. And Hawaii and Alaska were treated as international because you had to change your technology when, to get to them. So uh, that's, we are accustomed to thinking that the border would be geopolitical, certainly for regulatory purposes, but here was an instance in which it was a technological definition, not uh, geopolitical. Smart borders I won't say much about because you probably know um, a fair amount about it, but the, that's of course the effort to make our borders as informationally intense as possible. Free trade zones, I'm sure you're also familiar. Uh, what I hadn't realized till I did this was that in the U.S. you have at least one free trade zone within every one of the 50 states. And they become interesting because they multiply the number of places where you have uh, things that you can treat as borders. They have some implications for trade and services. And be, for, for about a decade now, there's been a move to develop unique telecommunications policy for free trade zones, especially those. And they're experimenting with that with the maquila doors that cross the U.S.-Mexico border. But the idea that you would define a unique zone for uh, regulation of the telecommunications network um, is quite interesting. Functionally equivalent borders, um, the law always has to work by metaphors and that makes sense, but of course the minute you walk down that path you can become quite creative in how you treat the metaphors or use them. We're all familiar with functionally equivalent borders when you fly into London from the U.S. They don't walk down the aisle of the airplane uh, when they get to the uh, U.K. border and look at your passport. You wait until you come into the city and you go through customs and that's a functionally equivalent border and it makes sense to us. Um, but again, now they've, in the last couple of decades, this has become a quite expansive concept. So now instead of having a bright line geopolitical border, the functionally equivalent border can be tens of miles or tens of kilometers uh, wide. And uh, they've also come up with notions like uh, an immigrant carries a functionally equivalent border with him or herself as he or she moves through the domestic space. Now we first saw this idea of a mobile zone uh, for distinct legal treatment um, uh, when they tried to figure out how to protect people who were going in and out of abortion clinics. This is again a couple decades old. Um, as you know, there was a period in the U.S. when people who were going in and out of clinics, whether they were the doctors, the nurses, or mothers, um, were getting attacked, sometimes killed. Uh, so one of the things they came up with was that for um, for a space of several meters, anybody going into or out of an abortion clinic, was that was a privacy zone. And it, you had the right to protest, but you didn't have the right to enter that privacy zone. And that meant you've parked a block away and you carry this sort of zone with you as you move up the block and into the building and back out. And we now have that kind of functionally equivalent border around uh, immigrants in the U.S. We have the export of borders, and I guess not surprisingly, but I got the most questions on this when I was in Canada. Um, uh, the U.S. has become quite aggressive, and I don't know how much other countries are doing this, uh, but the U.S. has become quite aggressive about saying, no, if we're concerned about what happens when you come into the U.S., it's not when you get to customs. You're going to have to do customs in Australia. And in fact, if you're putting something on the ship in Bremen, Germany, you have to take a fair amount of space in your port and set up basically a U.S. border over there. And it's uh, for those who are interested in the extraterritoriality, extrater you've got the word. Um, uh, exporting the border itself is another very interesting way of going about doing that. Now, all of this became most interesting to me when um, it was actually decided a few years ago that the Department of Homeland Security, which is our pr premier security unit now in the U.S., was given uh, the right to operate above the law, above the law when it's protecting the border. When you think of that, then export, functionally equivalent borders, multiplication of borders with free trade zones, and so on, uh, becomes even more interesting. Now, the issue that brought that uh, to legal attention was their desire to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border, and in at least one area where they did that, they would have to ignore environmental protection laws in order to do that. So they were given the right to ignore the environmental protection laws, but in the course of debate over that, the question was, is it only environmental protection laws or is it any law? And it was decided that it was not limited to environmental laws. So actually the next area that was of concern was employment law because most of what the Department of Homeland Security does, it does uh, without paying any attention to employment law in the U.S. 
And there are no restrictions as it stands. The language is quite broad and vague, actually. Um, and it's also not clear in the language whether it is at a border only or when it's protecting the borders. Of course, if it's protecting the borders, it's anywhere in the world. Um, but uh, that exemption from the requirement to follow the law when protecting borders uh, made all of this border question, at least to me, very interesting. And then state knowledge of itself. Um, uh, the, of the conclusions we can reach there. Um, the first is that we have better epigenetic knowledge, meaning knowledge at one point of time across space. Then we have genetic knowledge, meaning historical knowledge dealing with one particular place or community. Um, those are terms, again, that come from uh, uh, complex adaptive systems theory. Genetic knowledge is historical knowledge. In the social sciences, uh, we actually think a lot about epigenetic knowledge when we talk about globalization. That's what we're talking about. In both cases, you're making a claim about causal relations. If you're talking about genetic knowledge, you're also talking about historical, historically traceable causal relations. And when you talk about epigenetic developments, you're talking about causal relations that are essentially simultaneous around the globe at one point in time. Most of what we know about complex adaptive systems theory comes from the physical and biological sciences and has been brought into the social sciences. But this is an area where the social sciences actually know more about globalization than the physicists do. And so it's uh, going in the other direction right now. That um, as a corollary, or actually as a causal factor for the first point, it means we have better knowledge in uh, data, visual, and sensory forms than we do in narrative forms meaning our understanding of what it is to be a particular government or a particular polity, a particular society. Uh, we know more about that in data terms than we do in narrative terms. This is important for political purposes because we, we act politically, we make policy decisions on the basis of how we see ourselves within stories. Stories are narratives. If those narratives are incomplete, based on incorrect information, um, inaccurately formed, then we are either unable to act politically or uh, we are informing our policy decisions or not informing our policy decisions uh, in an incomplete or inappropriate way. Um, replacing the phrase now that's used a lot in Washington is uh, faith-based decision making as opposed to evidence-based decision making. And of course, you have a different kind of narrative at that point, but um, not data-based. And then we're seeing arbit arbitrary decisions regarding, or I'm using the phrase arbitrary, but decisions regarding the use of sophisticated analyses of evidence. So we know a whole lot about how to statistically manipulate data in order to make up for inaccuracies and in, that may result from a data collection method. We know that if you take a census, you're going to systematically undercount certain portions of the population. The people who are very poor, the people who are mobile, the people who are not at home in the language of the census, um, the people who are engaged in illegal activity, people who are stubborn. Um, uh, so twice now, the Census Bureau has gone uh, it, to the U.S. Supreme Court and said, we would like to statistically manipulate the census data to make sure that we fully account for what we know are underrepresented portions of the population in the census. And this is a political matter because the census is the source of information about how to distribute resources and what kinds of services need to be provided and so forth. And twice the Supreme Court has said, no, you can't do that because the word in the Constitution is enumerate, one, one, one. So when it comes to things like uh, identifying targets of surveillance, there's um, uh, willingness to do all kinds of sophisticated data manipulation. But when it comes to something like the census distribution of resources, there's a kind of resistance. And that seems uh, inconsistent in the least to say to me. Um, in terms of a few examples of how they're, I just want to say a little bit about some current surveillance practices in the US. Uh, the, um, a lot of what's happened since 9-11 is based in what's called new security theory, which was developed in 1990 after what was believed to be the close of the Cold War. One of the questions for new security theory was how do we identify the enemy if, um, you know, if those people aren't communists or Soviets or whatever it was. And they came up with four categories of the enemy under new security theory. Uh, one was terrorists that was undefined and we have seen where that has gone. Uh, one was anybody who's involved with drugs, so you've got Interpol acting often within states in ways that the governments of those states would not like. Um, uh, from anybody who economically 
provides a threat, and we now know that economic competition is being used as a justification for military action. And the fourth was anybody whose behavior is statistically unpredictable. Anybody whose behavior is statistically unpredictable, which of course is how I pick my friends and what you hope for in your children. Um, so what's interesting now is what are the kinds of things that will trigger surveillance on top, you know, obviously if you're a member of certain groups that will trigger it. Um, uh, there, it has become, I won't go into the detail because it's widely available about changes in, in uh, what it takes to get a search warrant um, uh, in U.S. law, but some of the patterns that will trigger interest. Um, you'll become a target of interest for surveillance purposes if you have ordered a pizza delivered to your home and paid for it with a credit card because the guys who flew the planes into the Twin Towers ordered pizzas at home and paid for it with a credit card. If in the same trip to the grocery store you order lamb, fire starter, and charcoal, that will make you... So obviously this is a spurious thing. We've had uh, for a couple of decades, uh, we've been using profiles for things like drug couriers. Uh, in the past, those profiles were developed on very carefully uh, developed statistical analyses of the behaviors and demographics and so on of the people that they were after. When you get to things like you've ordered a pizza and paid for it with a credit card, you are not working with a statistically sound profile. Obviously, you have a kind of spurious uh, relationship. Um, uh, Ashcroft had the goal, or, I'm sorry, the Attorney General um, at the time in two, oh, 2001 and for a while afterwards had a goal for a national database that would not only bring together information from uh, a variety of a variety of different kinds about citizens so that uh, it could be mined very easily, everything we knew about one individual, but he argued that that should include six degrees of separation. So network analysis is one thing if you're looking at actual communicative networks or behavioral networks, even though uh, use of network analysis to go after people when you have claimed a right of association is questionable. But network analysis is one thing because you have actual communications and behaviors. Six degrees of separation, he specifically named things like he wanted to know who had sat in your seat in an airplane six flights before you and six flights after you. Or who rented your apartment six people before you and six people after you. In the case of an apartment, if it's a really great apartment and a really tight friendship circle, you might pass it on, but otherwise, again, completely spurious. So it's hard to know what to do or to not do to become a target of surveillance at this point in the U.S. Um, and then in case you thought that not communicating was the answer, they also put in place what's called the lone wolf provision, which is that if you're living off in the woods, off the grid, off the communications grid, uh, you know, heating with wood and writing the great British novel, that will make you a target of suspicion because you're the lone wolf now and you don't have relationships. So um, it's a pretty, uh, might as well just go on doing whatever you're doing because it's hard to tell. So uh, if you look across um, the trends in all of those areas of the law that I listed earlier, uh, you can reach some overarching conclusions about what's happening uh, in the informational state. The first is that uh, the informational state knows more and more about individuals. Uh, while individuals know less and less about the state. The constitutional compact for uh, democracies as we have known them over the last couple hundred years, whether or not you have a constitution, you have constitution-like principles uh, as you do in the UK, uh, but the, the compact basically has been mutual transparency. The state does need to know something about you uh, in order to provide services, distribute resources, and so forth. But you also need to know something about how the state is operating in order to actively participate in democratic practices. Today's state knowledge of citizens is growing by many orders of magnitude, while for many different reasons we know less and less about what our governments are actually doing. A second is that the use of digital technologies may actually decrease rather than increase the possibilities of meaningful participatory democracy. And I think by now uh, we're certainly, I hope, past the utopian period in which it was believed that the internet would, you know, would bring the perfect participatory democracy. Um, but I think there are some issues that haven't received as much attention as they should yet. The first is that we have thought about uh, print literacy as the basis of classical political participation. You vote on the basis of what you've read. You participate in political discussion in print or on the basis of print-derived knowledge. Um, voting was a print-related activity. But today, actually, you often need mathematical knowledge and technical skills in order to act politically. Um, 
a couple of examples. One is, this is Phil Agri's point on privacy. If you really don't want your email to be searched, then write your own highly idiosyncratic code for how you take your email down off the web, and they won't be able to track it because it's idiosyncratic. Phil Agri can do that. I don't know how to do that. Um, and voting, I mentioned because we've, um, there's massive amount of very rigorous research on how, A, how easy it is to manipulate electronic voting machines. Uh, they've actually been saying things like, if you put a piece of yellow tape around the machine, you can't manipulate it. Um, but, uh, and we also have massive amounts of rigorous uh, evidence of how the machines have been manipulated in elections, the results of which we have accepted. To try to talk to the population about why electronic voting machines are such an important political problem is very difficult because the general level of understanding of what it means to tinker with an electronic voting machine just isn't there. So we have this huge political issue that is uh, receiving a lot of attention by some, by a focus group of people, but it's been next to impossible to get that into general public discourse. Um, and then just to mention, um, something that I've written about more elsewhere and that is uh, very much the subject of my future work. Uh, what I'm describing is uh, what I think is going to be a key political battle in the 21st century and the, um, the tagline is the battle between mathematics and narrative in the 21st century. I published a piece on First Monday last August called Tactical Memory that goes into this in some more detail. Um, but it turns out that one of the things the CIA is interested in right now is what are called inference attacks. An inference attack is your ability to reach a politically undesirable conclusion on the basis of information to which you legally have the right of access. So I first ran across the concept of inference attacks, not called that at the time, in the 1970s. There was a pretty famous court case called the Progressive Case a physics doctoral student using information in the public domain uh, was able to figure out how to make uh, an atomic bomb and the progressive magazine wanted to publish this piece. The US government came in and said you can't publish how to make a bomb and, uh, and the bias in the US has not been prior restraint stopping before speech but punishment after speech so this was an unusual move. The magazine said but all the information he used was in the public domain and the government actually came back and said oh well he had the right to it. He had the right to see that information, but he didn't have the right to relate information that he got in different places to each other and to think about it. So I ran a... They dropped the case in terms. Yes, they did, but that argument was made. Yes. I mean, that argument was made, and the piece did get published. And I actually have kind of changed my position on whether or not it should have been. But, um, but I ran across this argument when I was in grad school in the, in the early 80s, and I thought, this is, this is a bizarre line of thought. And um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I, I took up this as, um, I don't know if you have hobby lines of research, things that you may never publish in, but you just, they interest you so much, so you. So this became my Sandra's pet hobby line of research, were examples of how this kind of argument would show up, and then dipping, I got so far as I gave one paper to the Telecommunications Policy Research Conference. I've never published it, but I was looking at constitutional distinctions, distinctions in constitutional law, among different kinds of information processing, thinking that that's where you might find arguments against this line of saying you can't have certain modes of inference. Um, so I, as I say, I thought it was just Sandra's entertainment, and then I learned a few years ago that in fact the CIA is working very hard now on how to protect against inference attacks and the related aggregation attacks, which is your ability to reach a politically undesirable conclusion on the basis of a whole pile of information when you couldn't on any particular datum. Um, now, whether or not they will achieve some way of, of working with this, one way of doing it is messing with the data, uh, perturbing the data, fault, deliberately falsifying the data, and that also is uh, interesting from the facticity perspective. But um, it looks as if they're also looking at modes of argument, lines of logic, types of inference. And uh, so this has actually become, uh, for me, a very important line of research. And what I mean by the battle is that if it should be that in addition to classifying information, we reach a condition in which they are classifying modes of inference, then if one wants to freely engage in political speech, including in areas that may be considered undesirable by a current government, uh, 
Um, it becomes a creativity issue. It becomes an ability to frame narratives, to share information with each other in ways that are so creative that they elude any uh, algorithmic mesh that's being used at the time. Um, we're seeing a lot of fluidity and turbulence in uh, social, technological, and informational systems, and we need to remember that the same is then available to us from the policy perspective. And here I'm speaking in particular to sort of sometimes knee-jerk but very traditional assumptions that the conservative position in any given policy issue is to stand on existing law and, ex and, and existing institutional structures, and the progressive position may have to do with tinkering with those. Um, when we get situations like our current, the, what the current U.S. Attorney General, our, our leading uh, legal figure in the U.S., uh, when he takes the position that there is no protection for the writ of habeas corpus in the U.S. Constitution, um, then you're in a position in which taking the conservative position and saying, well, you know, since the 12th century we've been standing on habeas corpus and maybe we ought to continue to do that, becomes progressive and not the conservative uh, technique. And certainly we know that um, uh, given any particular political goal, uh, the tools available range from reinforcing rigid structures to even abandoning uh, rules altogether, but it's any place within there. Information policy tools are interchangeable for the state, but the effects are not necessarily so for the population. So uh, for time purposes, let me just talk about the first of these. Uh, most countries around the world are concerned about whether or not they'll have enough good programmers to support high-tech societies of the future. Two different policy ways of addressing that. Uh, one can be in, uh, it, working with their education system so that people have sufficient mathematical education and interest in science and technology to become those programmers. Another is uh, to uh, establish a special visa category that makes it easy to import programming, uh, people with programming skills from other countries. So in the U.S. we have an extremely aggressive H-1B visa program and we bring in um, programmers from India and Pakistan and China and all over the place and the, uh, the same treatment has not been given to the education system as aggressively. At the end of the day, so you want a certain labor force, you got that. W the difference for the population is um, quite large. There are examples in international relations and others I could give you. So um, I've been using the U.S. as a case. Of course, U.S. law becomes extended through harmonization, which in the case of law, of course, does not mean I realized finally people always thought I meant, and we're all in harmony. That's not what harmonization means for the law. It means that you've lined up legal systems with each other, and certainly um, uh, a, lot of what, a lot of what's happened around the world since 9-11 involved deliberate, explicit harmonization of laws in certain areas. You have formal agreements. It can be done by force. It happens in the global market for law. And here I rely in particular upon the French sociologist of law, Yves Desolais, who talks a lot about what happens when you're making international law in places where there is no pre-existing national law and the role of private law as precedent and so forth. Uh, in transition societies, whether the former socialist countries, countries of the former Soviet Union or places like South Africa, you also have governments looking around and going, gee, we need a commercial legal system, what should we do? And uh, U.S.-based think tanks largely have been quite aggressive in sending teams of lawyers to these transition societies saying, you know, you need a commercial system, we happen to have one, here it is. Uh, so we've been very success successful that way. Um, parallel developments all over the world. Um, again, I think a lot of this is not a question of one country influencing another. It's a question of the political form of the state itself evolving for a, for a complex number of reasons. And the U.S. is also an importer of law as well as an exporter, and uh, Jonathan is a good source of information on that. Um, Parallel changes in international agreements, just to say that uh, you can uh, find a lot of these developments also at the international level. I won't take time on that now. Um, but for uh, internet policy then, I think there are these implications for how you engage in analysis of internet policy in particular. First, uh, and because you deal with ICANN, this is already evident, but it deals with government and governance and governmentality, not just government. Um, uh, the corollary to the idea that uh, the depictions of the legal system that are what we're trained in civics classes and that the media report on may be the magician's finger, the corollary to that is that there are now uh, emergent policy processes. There may be very obscure 
policy making processes, and that often the battle is going on at the level of conflicts between policy processes themselves. And by this I mean, um, if any of you are familiar with the work by Schoen and Rhine, they give a very nice uh, picture of expanding circles of policy analysis. So at one level, you have competing ways of solving a particular policy problem, do cost benefit analysis or whatever you want. Um, and then you get to recognizing which stakeholders win and which lose given any particular solution. You start looking at the discourse in which the different players participate. You can then frame that discourse, and this is where Schoen and Rhine uh, get out to. And um, I'm arguing there's one more layer outside of discourse frames, and that is which policy process itself is going to win the day in terms of really shaping what's uh, going on. Um, we are accustomed to focusing on the law when we think about the law, but uh, when you think about the state as a complex adaptive system, you then see that the law is one set of practices and processes within a political field that includes a whole lot of other practices and processes. And here I'm using field in the way that Bordeaux uses determinacy and non-causal relations or non-linear causal relations is a field uh, to the figure of looking at causal relations and so on. And I think uh, in the policy analysis, uh, keeping the political field in mind as we look at the legal figure is a corollary. And that we uh, need to be looking not only at specific issues, but also at how those issues relate to each other in policy precession. You're not going to be able to read this, um, uh, but you'll have the slides up online. I just, uh, here are some of the different kinds of emerging and conflicting policy making processes that I think are important for uh, study of the internet. And there are two sources. There's an edited collection I did a couple years ago, the Emergent Global Information Policy Regime, which also includes Jonathan. Um, and a special issue of First Monday that came out last year called Command Lines, the Emergence of Governance in Cyberspace. Uh, the punchline of that is that a lot of the ways in which we are uh, interacting, engaging in practice on the internet is actually affecting our offline political lives um, in ways that may not involve uh, or that go beyond explicit engagement with, say, lobbying for a particular candidate or on a particular issue and have more to do with political socialization, what you expect of life as a citizen and so forth. Um, another development here, and again, the OII is interesting in this way, and Berkman, uh, the Berkman Center at Harvard, Yale, uh, UCLA, and uh, Stanford law schools have been also quite apt in this area is seeing law schools as sites of social science research and experimentation with the policy subject. So in, it's not just reactive, obviously, it's proactive, and not just proactive in terms of experimental ways of thinking about the law, but thinking about what the law might actually be dealing with. So again, just to summarize the argument, uh, it's that there's phase change in the complex adaptive system that is the state. That yields a change in the state, the condition of our social and political system as well. This is in large part accomplished through the use of information policy and the exercise of power. And if you want to see what the effects of this have been, you want to look at social identity, structure, borders, and change. So thank you. <laughs> yes. You spoke of the, uh, the addition of intent to libel law as though that were new, but hasn't that always been a part of the murder law, for example? Uh, yes, it was new in libel law, which interested me because of the focus on information, communication, and culture. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you about sort of how you study the information. Uh, the information state. I mean, you were talking about power at the beginning and, inform and informational power. And, I mean, I, I'm a political scientist and, and, and we always, uh, I mean, I think people, uh, we always imagine that sort of politics is all about power and quite often it just isn't about power, actually. We're not very good at studying power. But how, uh, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of quite often, it's quite rarely mentioned, really, <laughs> perhaps surprisingly. But, um, I mean, by, by sort of using the word informational and saying that informational power is at the basis of all other kinds of power, I mean, how can you actually pull it out and study it? Uh, what, what, what's, what, what's your unit of analysis if you, if you remove the, the technology itself? Yeah, I'm not saying at the basis of all other. I'm saying that its use has, has in some 
instances changed how they're carried out. So the smart gun, stupid gun uh, example. Not all exercises of instrumental power are going to be informationally informed and so forth. Um, I'm doing it at a very macro level. So I'm doing it by, uh, you're right, I am um, making some, I'm linking developments in the law with what I understand to be their consequences for uh, how we're living together as we know that from the results of empirical social science research. So I'm not, the, I'm not assuming that often this is intentional, that there's a specific actor who's saying, I'm now going to do X. <coughs> I think actually uh, often the consequences of some of these legal developments have not been, not only not been intentional, but not been foreseen by those who are looking at a different kind of question when they're developing the law in particular areas. But whether or not they were foreseen or expected or intended, they are the consequences. That doesn't fully answer it, but I'm not doing I'm not doing quantitative empirical research here. I'm, I think my job has been largely conceptual and theoretical. Yeah, I, I've got a background in more and moral and political philosophy. Now, it seems to me that um, this is an, an empirical hypothesis. You're facing all this around, um, but I, I think you could say that there's a crypto normative. Uh, aspect in it, not not explicitly normative. Um, it seems to be dystopian, um, or, or a. You seem to be saying things are getting worse. Uh, is is that right? Um, <laughs> I told you she'll tell you. Be afraid. <laughs> uh, and it, well, could you say a little more about the? Um, uh, you know, you didn't mention justice, um, distribution, access morality, ethics. I mean, it's entirely within a, a sort of legal, or at any rate, empirical paradigm, the whole analysis. A lot of people would want to talk about uh, normative issues in this context. I'd just like illumination on, on your position. Well, I think some of the conclusions certainly have normative foundations. Um, uh, although, you're right, I'm, I'm pinning them to the law. I think that um, there's Three pieces, at least, in response to that. First, that um, I've, I've often been fascinated by the fact, for two decades in my work, I've been fascinated by the fact that people will say to me that they don't know what my political position is when I think it's entirely evident. <laughs> but I actually take that as a kind of compliment. Um, uh, because I'm trying to, and one of the things that's been pleasing to me with this book is some people who actually completely disagree with me politically felt that I had a fair-handed analysis of the thing. And so partially my goal is to uh, be able to uh, speak with those who may actually think that this is all quite wonderful. I mean, you know, if John Ashcroft liked this book, I, you know, I'd be pretty happy. Um, because I think there's a mode of analysis there that would be uh, useful no matter what. There certainly are I certainly am staking out a clear normative position here. One of the things that's difficult is, two of the things that are difficult is the short range versus the long range. I started this book, this was a 20 year project. Um, and in fact, its first, uh, its first title was The Tipping Point, but two books came out with that title before I got there. Um, and, but so the point is that this the was- The second title was Megatrends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, and so, this, so it, I'm emphasizing that because it preceded the, the analysis, the mode of analysis preceded 9-11. What's happened since 9-11 is egregious in my view and is certainly dystopian. So um, the fact that it finally comes out after these extreme developments of the last few years probably gives it a more dystopian air uh, than it would have been. I think there's a whole lot of, a lot of my work actually ever since I entered academia has been uh, trying to find ways of framing things that break out of polarized discussions. Mm -hmm. So telecommunications policy analysis in the early 80s was still people, either you were a neoclassical economist and you told anybody you had social or political or cultural concerns that they were idiots and didn't know how the world worked, or you had social, cultural, and political concerns and thought that all microeconomists, uh, <laughs> neoclassical microeconomists were Hitler. And neither one of those positions was useful and people were screaming at each other in the hallways. So, uh, one of my goals with framing information policy as an umbrella term this way was to try to break out of that 
polarized discussion by shifting the conversation. And I think the same thing is true for what surrounds what's normative about what's going on here. So what, what, is, what tradition for the source of social values are you appealing to? Would you appeal to? Well, I mean, what, what was the source of norms in your uh, approach? Um, I don't make them explicit in this book, and in a sense, I guess I've never done that academically, I have to say. I've worked with other intellectual frameworks in the writing. Mm. Um, but I think there, and, and I'm, um, so it would take a longer answer, but I yeah. take a theoretically pluralist position, there's no one place I would look. And it's, so it's been important to me to use complex adaptive systems theory also for that reason, because I think there are, there are certainly weaknesses in, in, in liberal thought, even Rawlsian thought. Mm. I published a piece last year on the limits of diversity, for example. I think this, yes, we need uh, diversity of opinions in public discourse, but if that's as far as you've gotten, the whole enterprise will still fail because other pieces are, are necessary. So um, I, I'll take that as I should do the normative piece. I no, should no. fully explore that. But, um, the other piece that I think makes it complicated is it isn't clear to me, um, a question I very often get is like, is this all about Bush? No, it's not all about Bush. Is this about Republicans? No, it's not about Republicans. Um, the changes have been taking place since the 70s, at least under a variety of administrations and for a variety of, some of them very good reasons. The Paperwork Reduction Act, let's have more efficient government. Who can disagree with that? Where that went in terms of rules about what research we can use as evidence for policy making, um, I don't agree with, but the initial impetus, what's wrong with that? So there are lots of causes. I do think there are some politically savvy figures. I mean, for a while after 9-11, I thought there was some like think tank uh, of people who were looking at every line in US code going, how can we flip it? And it turns out there wasn't. There was one guy in Cheney's office who Cheney finally alienated enough that he quit too, but there was one guy looking at every piece of legislation as it came through. Um, and, you know, a few people see where this is going. Mostly I don't think they do. I think it's uh, more diffuse than that. But the other question is um, dystopian or ut utopian, there's a kind of King Canute aspect to it on the technology side. Be just as the people who launched the first atomic bomb didn't really know that it wouldn't ignite the entire atmosphere, but they, like, had to launch it, it's not clear to me that we could not have surveillance in a society with the computing te and networking technologies that we have. I'm not sure as a species we're capable of saying no to that. So if as a species that's where we're going, then I'm not sure that the dystopian, utopian matrix is the right thing. There's some other question about what, it, what the species is about. That would worry me, actually. I mean, that's a good example of where I think you maybe need to be more explicit about the norms because that, that smacks of uh, deter technological determinism. You know, and I think maybe we need to foreground. Uh, uh, you Not know. at all. It's a species determinism. Okay. It's okay. saying we've <laughs> had this tool. And, you know, and again, obviously there's limits to what I can talk about in one probably yeah, okay. too long talk. And, okay. um, uh, no, very much not. No. Well, then. Um, could you just further elaborate on the distinction between the, the battle of the narratives versus, I guess, uh, traditional civic political narrative versus what you call a, a mathematical narrative? Because it, it seems that, I guess, in the case of um, uh, finding statistical thresholds for inference uh, to determine surveillance, um, you know, could be something that doesn't fit into explicit political categories. But at the same time, it does seem that, be that science certainly plays a role in civic discussion, so. I'm not sure I followed the last well, bit Well, I'm just, I'm just, could you just elaborate further on the distinction between the two, the mathematical narrative and the, what I, what I understand to be oh, a mathematical kind of meshes for narrative. Mathematical meshes for narrative. Yeah. And oh, this is, this is pure speculation now. This is going off into fantasies of where it, what, it might be to be working on inference attacks, but knowing the kind of pattern recognition stuff that's going on with data mining now. Um, and so uh, you already have the, the tactical media people have already taken the position that um, if you are unhappy politically, that alternative media, and you think that mainstream media only have one political perspective, um, that you need alternative media to get out another political perspective. The tactical media argument has been already that you're always going to lose that game. You know, it's just never going to win. 
So instead of working with an alternative message, they're messing with the medium itself is a tactic. Um, uh, it has not been an effective tactic. Uh, so, so you've got traditional alternative media, you've got people struggling with things like media concentration, you've got um, tactical media kinds of games. What, I'll point you to the tactical memory piece. I think you have things like, um, if you're going to be identified by taking a particular political position or by uh, linkage of different kinds of information that sit on your laptop at one point in time or by your surfing habits, which we know they're doing, if those kinds of linkages become um, subject to analysis of inference, then, I'm just repeating myself now, then the ways in which you tell stories to each other politically becomes a deeply creative manner. We've had a long tradition of Aesopian language, so Jonathan Swift is often pointed to as somebody who told these fabulous stories because they weren't perceived to be political. And that's the only point I'm making, that we'll have to be very creative about how we deliver political messages if the worst scenario about surveillance, including surveillance of inference, comes to, comes to be. Yeah. I'd like to pursue your issue of the uh, smart gun along another, another line, because I, I think this story of the smart gun is a preposterous piece of uh, propaganda by the people who want to sell equipment. Uh, like the uh, anti-ballistic missile, which I worked on 40 years ago and was as preposterous then as it is now. And, uh, preposterous <coughs> in the sense of it can't work? Yeah. Period. Yeah. No. Uh, with all of these things, you have, with, with all of these initiatives, and this comes back to Alistair's point, you have a pretense or even a governmental belief that such and such a measure will work, upon which they behave, their, they base their beliefs, and indeed the unexpected consequences, as with everything on the internet, proliferate in every possible direction. So the normative issues become extremely complex because the law of intended consequences becomes an escalation beyond anything anyone could possibly predict. You're absolutely right. All I can say is amen to that, and that, and that is another uh, piece of response to the normative question because the, even the question of whether or not it actually is possible to have a database that combines information about everybody that can actually usefully be mined, there's still extreme disagreement about that, and I think for good reason. So one can question all of these things. I, 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 in this talk, I do uh, I paint a very stark picture, and, and there are three reasons for it. Um, uh, one is that I think in the general population, which may not be true of the people in this room, but in the general population, there's so little knowledge of what's been changing in the law that I picked dramatic examples to highlight that and hopefully encourage people to learn more. Um, the second is that some of what I've pictured is, uh, is to our knowledge not being um, acted on very much right now. Um, there are two pieces of that. One is that if, the, uh, if there uh, isn't a change at the top in the next election in the U.S., then it's possible that laws that are in place that are not being used or that are being barely used will be used much more. But second is we, to some extent, don't actually even know how much they're being used um, for any number of reasons. Like even court cases are disappearing from dockets, which is uh, the stuff. But that doesn't address your point. You're right. I mean, one could just believe in contingency as, as um, uh, an important normative foundation as well. Um, so I have a question about your, uh, your the actors in your story. So the way I sort of read it was on, on the one side you had your uh, law, policy, and government, and then the other side was sort of this undifferentiated, uninformed public. And I'm, I'm wondering what you do with the sort of the proliferation of actors that all these that policy analysts have been adding into the story in the last 10 years or so. So I'm thinking here, you know, Giddens and his experts, expert knowledge and, 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 and consultation with them and their involvement in policy, Vex, uh, statisticians and, and variety of kinds of experts, uh, Valkyrie stars, uh, standards bodies, um, Epstein's uh, social groups, social movements and their involvement with the public, how, how they become informed and involved with policy. So 
uh, different responses to that. One is that, again, you can't do everything in one book or one talk. So I referred to other work on the processes by which it's made, but that was not the focus of this book. It's on what happens after it's made. Um, so certainly, I'm familiar with all, and we could go further, policy networks, uh, the government, the cultural foundations of policy and all are where uh, some of my more recent and, and future work will be. So talking about the effects of policy once made is a separate question from how it's being made. Um, but some of that that you mentioned, I mean, at the moment in the U.S., experts have a very hard time. This is not no longer an evidence or expertise run government. There are completely other things going on. So the extent to which any particular process or set of actors may be pertinent is going to be very time and issue specific. Um, um, uh, my question is about the, uh, your statement regarding the participation in the information age. Um, you, uh, if I'm uh, right, you said that the participation is decreasing um, in the information age? I said the, that it may not be that it expands our ability to participate in a dem democracy. Participatory democracy may not necessarily be made more easy by yes. the internet. What is the basis of uh, that assumption or statement? Is there any empirical evidence? Uh, I'm concerned about the fact that forms of literacy beyond print literacy are necessary for full effective participation today. And uh, whether or not, and we have declining print literacy, but we certainly don't necessarily have expanding technological and mathematical literacy. Um, technological means of undercutting democratic practice, so your vote is meaningless if the voting machine is going to be tinkered with. Uh, but the emphasis was on forms of literacy was the point I was trying to make here. Yeah. You, you talk briefly about, the, um, about cyborgs, about the fact that machines are now subjects of the law in addition to humans. And I wonder if this does not come in contradiction with a structuralist informational view of the state. Um, I mean, if you, if you adopt a post-structuralist view of the individual, then why doesn't this not apply to the state as well? And this is my question. I think that if I'm, yeah, but from a complex adaptive systems yeah. approach, it is post-structuralist view of the state as well. I thought it was actually a combination of this structure. Structural well, just as view of this uh, <laughs> just as uh, the internet is theoretically a non-hierarchical environment, but it's possible to have hierarchies within it. Right. So, within a post-structural environment, it's possible to have structural right. processes and effects. I should mention because it sort of underlay uh, some of the questions about technological determinism and other kinds of things, but um, in the book and in other material, and I could do it now, but I won't take the time, but I do make a distinction between pre-industrial tools, uh, industrial technologies, and um, uh, informational meta-technologies that are qualitatively different from each other and as a consequence um, make, enable some of these other changes. So that's a piece of this as well. I don't think we have one kind of technology. In. Would you agree or disagree that at this moment humanity has a greater ability to access information, to exchange information among itself in history? I think that's true. And if that's true, do you, how do you work that thread into the dystopian worries that you have where basically we see a state that's getting more powerful and an individual that's getting less so? Well, it's, you don't pick one moment in time. So uh, we have less access to certain kinds of information since 2000 than we had before. All the information that's gone from government websites and things that are shut down and the reclassification of information that was declassified. So. As a general statement, I would say yes. As a, if you're going to look at particular political environments, you sometimes get a no. But more importantly, the access isn't, um, and, and certainly I think we have less access to information about the government. Although, again, like the Freedom of Information Act thing may be reversed. Um, it's being discussed right now and so forth. But uh, I think the number of ways in which they have justified not allowing knowledge of governmental processes is quite extreme and not we don't have more of that so is your very general statement yes in particular sometimes no and then the question becomes what we can what we can do with that and how we're allowed to use it and so forth I just think about the 
peer-to-peer -peer networks of amateur plane spotters who just go to airports and write down tail numbers for fun, and then others who can assemble that to figure out that the CIA is doing extraordinary rendition by just looking at the tail numbers as they land in airports across Europe. I mean, FOIA almost seems like a very oh, elementary tool. Absolutely. Please, CIA, tell us who you're extraordinarily renditioning That's right. next to that. Absolutely, and that's actually a good example of what I mean by narrative creativity, in a sense, because that's exchanging a kind of information that, in a way, that was incredibly powerful, um, uh, but that eluded detection actually for a long time because it was—it just looked like silly people. Can I briefly step in here? Jonathan, it sounds like you are assuming that all any sort of additional information, having more information, is always a good thing. And, um, I mean, if somebody knows all about you, is that necessarily a good thing? I mean, the whole surveillance thing... Uh, oh, I thought you were going to go in a different direction. I thought you were going to say, if there are too many doors, you can't open any of them, and you get into this Borges Library of Babel problem. Mm -hmm. But instead, mm -hmm. you said, <laughs> aren't there times when more information is bad? And that may be, although that's also an interesting juxtaposition. Here we have individual versus state, and maybe the template is individual versus individual, then. I, I would agree that uh, the focus exclusively on the state probably misses a part of the story, because uh, some of the huge data collectors these days are not of the state, but are of the private sector. So, so the, the picture is bigger than that. But, but I'm but just asking about, about the question of any information, any more of information is not necessarily a good thing. And I, I wanted to, to, to say that you probably agree that there are categories of information, the proliferation of which we do not think is a societal plus. Yeah, I have to, um, uh, I did say at the beginning that governance would deal with all the corporate data collection that you're talking mm -hmm. about, but that the focus here was on government. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, well, this was more, yeah. more I, I would than. agree with that. There's some facts that the world is a worse place when they're released, even if they're true. Mm -hmm. um, what to make of that is not clear, but yes, I would agree with that. But also in between even large amounts and effective use that you're talking about are meaningful, or the ability to make meaning comes, the ability to structure, um, to process cognitively as individuals, to process as decision-making units. There's a lot more to it than just the information. Well, so who should have control about the data that are out about you? In German law, there is a concept of informational self-determination. Um, they are struggling with implementing that. that. This is a concept from sort of 25 years ago when they had the, the, the constitutional court ruling for, about the census. Um, uh, how they implement it these days, I, I don't know. Uh, but but the, the normative idea underlying that is, that is that you should be the gatekeeper of all the information that is out there about you. That again sort of uh, is something you can discuss, but uh, from a normative point of view, I think it's quite interesting. It is. The number of conditions, though, in which you must make your personal choice to exchange that data if you're going to operate is huge. So, yeah, no, that will be hard. Also, basically, it's impossible. <laughs> well, that's never been any uh, burden to a lawyer who, who has <laughs> set out a principle. The British notion of privacy <clears throat> and keeping everything private is, is so extreme to an American. That, uh, that, that, that you know, I don't care who knows what magazines I subscribe to. Very, very little information about me that I want to keep secret. You and I don't understand yeah. this. And that's particularly true of you, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> a typical American. <laughs> that's particularly true of you. <laughs> it seems to me that, that well, people who are secretive as to whether they own two blue shirts, you know, this this does seem to be very extreme and and very <laughs> unimaginable. The um, attack of the straw men. <laughs> Can we, we beat them off? This also, if we, uh, come back to your comment about, con the two comments about contingency before, because actually this also points to what some of the effective modes of resistance have been. So in between any law and its, and its effects uh, actually comes implementation, whether that's programmatic or a matter of will. And so much of this has failed just because it isn't acted on. Um, it can be stopped at the individual institutional level. It's stopped at the individual level. Over 350 Cities in the U.S. have told their police forces not to comply with certain elements of the Patriot Act because they, those cities took the position that this was unconstitutional. And that's not just the Madison, Wisconsin of the world. It's Detroit and Juneau and places like that. So there are all kinds of ways in which um, 
uh, the picture as painted is not necessarily the picture on the ground. Well, I mean, there's, such, there's so many empirical uh, propositions here that could be, uh, I mean, it's a real wealth of um, hypotheses about B. But I'm wondering about this confidence issue of where, why is it that on the one hand, uh, government can't implement an IT system, you know, <laughs> say in health or <laughs> taxes or you name it, and then yet there seem omniscient in terms of in uh, context, most companies <laughs> can't implement an IT system. Yes, no, not a, so. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a, an, almost an assumption of maybe competence here that it maybe is over. I'm well, not sure. Maybe that's the perception of of competence in this area that is not necessarily. Maybe there's no. It's not as. as no, and that's. I, I agree, and that's what I mentioned earlier that the uh, that the claim that these databases can do what they're doing and that their searching can do what it's doing. So is, incompetence becomes our salvation. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, Hans Magnus Enzensberger wrote a wonderful book called Mediocrity and Delusion, and um, it may be that right incompetence and and uh, contingency should be our. Yeah. And on the flip side, I mean, the theme is that there's a lot of competence in among uh, individual citizens, and I mean, in terms of uh, civil society groups, lobby groups, and so forth, that can use quite sophisticated modeling and mathematical models or computer models and to fight government uh, models and you know, I mean that's right so and that's the competence more competence on the citizen side maybe less competence on the state side than, than well, maybe there is a measurement question for you but <laughs> yes. um, well I was yeah I mean I was going to ask yeah. that question question too because I mean what's different about contemporary technology particularly the internet mm -hmm. is that sort of to some extent society is smarter than um, uh, the state so I mean, it is a it is a problem with sort of looking at policy without the effect of policy, isn't it? Because it is a two way interaction. I mean, it always has been. I mean, smart bombs, for example. You, you know, there's plenty of smart responses to smart bombs that don't even involve technology. I mean, placing Saddam Hussein's place, placing his embassy next to an orphanage, for example. You know. Right. Um, right. But but I'm talking about more than the internet here. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and I mean, society in, in general sort of is, 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 is smarter. Well, I think that that's a $6 billion question, really. And um, I mean, again, you, you're, you're the source of global expertise on this, but there is still um, whatever may be in the heads of the confidence of, what's, of some individuals in this room regarding their understanding of the technology of the internet, which is going to go way beyond mine. Um, there still is a lot of concern in general about uh, recentralization and uh, global controls. Uh, whether or not that's, you know, we can probably keep working around that, yeah. So Sandra has to catch a train. Yeah. Um, but please, uh, let's thank her. For oh, thank you.